When it comes to primary care, everyone is trying to get more. More prevention, more chronic care management, more quality measures. In fact, one estimate suggests that for a typical panel, a physician would have to devote 21 hours per day to deliver all the care recommended for a Medicare patient. But since the only thing we can't get more of is hours in a day, the numbers don't work. Medicare has created a revenue stream by paying for prevention and care management. But in order to make the numbers work, health systems need to change their current business models and find ways to use physicians' time more efficiently. For example, let's look at an annual wellness visit, which typically takes about an hour. Medicare will pay out $125 for this appointment. But if a physician provides all of the care, they're using about $150 worth of time. These numbers just don't add up. But if most of that appointment is spent with a nurse or medical assistant with only five minutes of physician time, a typical clinic can realize a profit margin of $50 on every wellness visit. Obviously, this is only effective if the staff is well-trained and the daily huddle is well-prepared. But when it works, the results are outstanding. Better patient care, an increased ability for physicians to care for patients, and more revenue for the practice. This synergy is what a Caravan Health Accountable Care Organization is all about. Our model promotes a team-based approach that keeps physicians, clinicians, and office staff working together to effectively manage each patient's health. And our results speak for themselves. 73% of our physicians say the ACO has helped improve the quality of care. And 77% agree that adding a population health nurse has increased their capacity to support patients with complex conditions. Best of all, by successfully increasing the number of annual wellness visits you perform, you can reduce total health care costs by up to 6% and generate a significant increase in revenue at the same time. Everyone might be trying to get more from their health care, but with Caravan, we can help you deliver. With Caravan Health, now the numbers work. Back to another episode of MedTech Trends. I'm your host, Dorian. So today we have with us Tim Groniger, who is the CEO of Caravan Health. Now, Tim joined Caravan in 2017 as the Senior Vice President for Strategy and Development, and he later became the President in 2018, and of course, he's currently serving as CEO. Now, in these roles, he oversaw the company's delivery and operations, as well as marketing and its strategic growth plan. He's also the former Chief of Staff and Director of Delivery System Reform at CMS, where he led the agency's work on drug spending, significant elements of the agency's implementation of new physician payment system uh, created by the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015, uh, as well as the creation of new payment models. He was also uh, the Senior Advisor for Health uh, Care Policy at the White House Domestic Policy Council, where he was responsible for coordinating administration activities in healthcare uh, delivery system reform. Before joining DPC, he was a senior professional staff member for ranking member Henry Waxman uh, at the House uh, Committee on uh, Energy and Commerce, where he was responsible for drafting and developing elements of the Affordable Care Act. So welcome, Tim. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, glad to, to have you with us here today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So uh, I really wanted to uh, to dive into um, the uh, affordable um, or accountable care organization, uh, which is a, a type of program that was uh, developed by CMS. Uh, and um, Caravan Health is, of course, one of the the leading sort of models of, of the ACO um, uh, type, if you will. Uh, it's had huge successes. It has a long history as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't think of a better person to sort of get into this, uh, this model and how it works, uh, what it's all about um, than, uh, than yourself. And I wanted to start off with, you know, uh, coming from a, a background where you were working um, at CMS, what was the, what was the shift like going from CMS into um, sort of a more private kind of sector setting? Um, you know, were there, were there any surprises or consistencies between what you anticipated sort of building the ACO model um, at CMS versus what it's like bringing on new clients now as uh, end users? Yeah, it, uh, it's a great question. And there, there were, of course, a lot of differences working when you uh, have the resources and reach of the federal government uh, available, uh, not at your disposal, at the public's disposal, but at the uh, the the reach and ability to touch the healthcare system in in such significant ways uh, at CMS, uh, the the trillion dollar agency that that nobody's heard of, of course. Um, 
the the efforts that that we went to in partnership uh, across HHS and with the private sector at the time to create new payment models like accountable care organizations that that step away and attempt to leap away from fee for service payment models. Uh, there were a lot of changes for me going to the private sector, and um, and I embraced those. And uh, Caravan was a, a great fit for me because we had um, uh, an innovative uh, founder and CEO at that time, and Lynn Barr, who had stitched together this this uh, concept of a, a, an accountable care organization that is composed of providers who are not owned by one another, who are not in um, uh, employment relationships with one another, but are working together towards common ends of uh, managing the total costs of care and improving the, the quality and experience of care that they're providing to their patients. And uh, so for me, it was a difference between uh, creating a, a, pos a favorable environment and allowing business models to be created that can be organized around total costs and total quality, and then actually doing it uh, in partnership with providers all around the country. So it's been an exhilarating uh, process and uh, one, one in which I learned something every day. Now, it's funny you mentioned that, uh, you know, CMS is this uh, trillion dollar uh, organization that uh, that not a lot of people sort of know was really working hard in the background. Um, I, you know, I almost feel as I was doing my, my research on ACOs, um, I would draw almost a parallel in the sense that, you know, ACOs have been around for a long time. Um, you know, at least 10 years, possibly 20 or more. And I think they're also related to the older concept of HMOs, um, as far as my understanding goes, you, you know, but at the same time, you know, are people really aware of ACOs working in the background? Um, and, uh, and they've done, there's been a huge growth in, uh, in ACOs. Um, there, are, there are hundreds of these, um, you know, not all are created equal, of course, and we'll get into that. But, you know, is that, is that a, is that a pain point, if you will? Is it difficult to get that, get that message across that there's this organization, this ACO model that, that is working hard to balance, you know, population health, cost savings, uh, and is do and offers a very unique uh, value add in doing so. Yeah, the the growth of ACOs has been much more rapid than I think most people realize, even in the industry. Uh, if you want to uh, manage care as a good comparison, uh, in Medicare managed care in particular. Uh, it was Medicare Advantage under prior previous names was introduced to the program in 1983, and by the end of the 80s was still under single digit percentage wise in uh, enrollment in the program and, and beneficiary covered lives. Um, by contrast, the ACO program was introduced to Medicare in, in earnest in 2012. There were prior pilots and, and demonstration programs, and by 2020, 2021 now, we have more than 10 million beneficiaries uh, in the, the primary version of ACO, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, uh, and a couple more million in, in more experimental, higher risk forms, uh, higher financial risk for providers forms, like the Next Generation ACO Program, which, uh, you know, about a third, uh, between a fifth and a third of beneficiaries are in these models right now. So the, the growth has been rapid. Um, you ask about whether people are aware. I'd say most patients are not aware of what this concept is, and there's maybe some downsides to that, but certainly most providers uh, are aware. And I remember early on in the program talking to physicians and, and hospital leaders just casually uh, back when we could talk to people at, at cocktail parties and not Zoom events. Um, and the most most of them did not really track this model. It wasn't something that had reached very far. Uh, today, every uh, health system leader is certainly is aware of what they are. Many of them have participated in an ACO at this point. Um, every uh, virtually every physician knows what they are. Uh, so, so they have a very large market presence and mind share. Um, uh, and the distinction versus Medicare Advantage, I think, is important to draw out further because the, the origins of the ACO program were really an effort to step away from fee-for-service medicine, which, you know, we mentioned this before. Fee-for-service medicine, the incentive to provide more services, proce procedures, diagnostics, uh, therapies, uh, prescription drugs, um, because everything is paid for on a, a per unit or per widget basis. And professionalism has historically been the primary uh, resistance to that that I in other words the idea that physicians acting as professionals acting on, on the best interest of the patients are not going to just purely act in their own profit motive and uh, and certainly in most cases that's true 
Um, but oftentimes uh, on the margins, it's easy to confuse your own uh, financial interests with the patient's best interests, especially when it's, well, what's the harm from doing a, an additional battery of diagnostic tests, even if they have some portion of them with false positives that will lead, some of which will lead to unnecessary surgeries? Or what's the harm in bringing a patient back for a visit when we really could handle this with a three-minute phone call? Uh, if the financial model is set up in such a way that you're going to get paid for something that's on the margin, uh, then the margin and says that you're going to uh, you're going to provide the service, and so ACOs are a at the core. The really boring answer is ACOs are a contract between providers and the payer, and the contract is trying to flip the incentives on their heads and say, we want you to provide, we the public or we the payer, or we the patients want you to provide a certain level of quality of care. Um, and the medical standards that we we want to continue to have the same access to care, um, but we also want you to pay attention to costs too. And if you uh, if you spend as much as we did last year plus an inflation target, then you're gonna uh, if you can beat that benchmark, then you we're gonna share in that savings with you as the the provider that that can be in charge of those outcomes. Uh, and so it's a really uh, important remaking of the, the financial underpinnings of the healthcare system. Um, and that's why I think it's so exciting that the model is spreading as quickly as it is. Yeah, you touched on a, a bunch of um, areas that I, I wanted to dive into in this conversation. Um, just uh, just for perspective for, for folks listening to, I mean, we're talking about a program that I think up until uh, 20, maybe 2020 or so, um, it's resulted in cost savings uh, around 400 million to CMS. So it's a, it's a very successful program um, financially and, and in practice as well. So we're talking about uh, hundreds of ACOs that have thousands and thousands of members. Uh, Caravan, of course, is, is sort of leading the pack in, in a lot of ways in, in um, the way that it's uh, put together. It's a, it's a unique model to do this. And, um, you know, it's very, it's very effective and it, it's very reassuring, I think, to hear that a lot of people are aware of it. Um, and at the same time, like we were saying, ACOs are not all created equal. So there is, there is a winning sort of recipe. Um, and uh, let's see if we can, if we can dive into that. Um, maybe, Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll frame the, the question this way. So at its heart, um, you know, the ACO model allows um, a network of providers to um, deliver care in such a way that um, you ultimately end up um, focusing on preventive care. And, um, and through that approach, uh, there's a cost sharing um, uh, or a risk sharing sort of approach uh, where you can partner with CMS. Uh, and if you do it successfully by the numbers and so scale becomes extremely important, um, then then you basically earn back a lot of a lot of savings while still maintaining high quality care, which is something again that uh, that Caravan's been uh, very, very um, successful at doing. Would that be sort of a, a fair way to put at what what the ACO model essentially is? It is. And I, I would, uh, if I may uh, elaborate a little bit on your structure, the Going back to the financial underpinnings here, the the opportunity to share in savings generated by an investment in improvements in prevention or care management or uh, managing certain parts of the patient experience is created by that opportunity to to earn shared savings. And so, uh, without this different contract structure doing additional prevention or doing a better job of managing care transitions from the hospital is going to result in potentially better care for the patients. Uh, hopefully, certainly if you're providing more services, you hope that the quality and care experience improves. Um, but there, there's not any reason to believe that those investments are going to result in uh, in improved economic improvements in the healthcare system. Uh, they, they may, they may not. The, the evidence suggests that you, you provide it, these additional services in the context of a fee-for-service model, costs are going to go up, patients are going to pay more, uh, employers and governments are going to pay more, and outcomes are going to be roughly neutral. But if you wrap that in, a, in the context of uh, an ACO contract where you're mo monitoring quality measures and you're monitoring the outcomes you care about, uh, then you can see some of the results you alluded to earlier. And it, the, the savings to CMS are actually, well, uh, the academic studies on this that, that take there's the program metrics, which are sort of what CMS paid, what CMS received, but then there's the the 
quasi randomized methods where you look at how a comparison group of patients and providers would have fared without this model. Uh, and there's there's very good evidence at this point that the program is saving the government uh, a good deal of money, certainly uh, in the billions of dollars per year range. Uh, and that can translate to savings for patients as well. And that's also money that can be reinvested back into the system to create even more programs uh, in much the same way, I suppose, that, uh, that you were doing while, while at CMS. So new um, uh, uh, payment models, new ways of delivering care. Uh, so it becomes, it's essentially reinvested back into the system. So it seems like a win-win, I think, all around. What if we can get a, a little bit more into how Caravan itself works and um, maybe the one of the questions that I that I was really interested in is, you know, where where does the name Caravan come from, and uh, and then we'll dive into some of the ways that uh, Caravan thinks about this uh, this ACO model. Yeah, this is uh, this is deep Caravan lore here. So uh, this was prior to my time at the company. So I'm going off of what I've been told, but I, this story has been checked out by a couple of different uh, sources and and folks who were there. The uh, the the concept that we were going for with that name choice. Originally, we were the National Rural ACO uh, Services Organization. And so we had grown out of this sort of unusual ACO concept where uh, 10 rural hospitals from four different states, including Washington, Michigan, Min Mississippi, uh, Nevada, had joined together to form an ACO together. And CMS looked at that and did, was surprised to uh, see that application because the, the concept we all had was from prior pilot versions of the program. There were organizations like Dartmouth Hitchcock uh, organized around providers in New Hampshire. We all, we all sort of figured, okay, it's, it's physician groups in a region and people that they know come into the model as an ACO. Um, but if you look at the program rules, uh, the, this concept was allowed and, and uh, Caravan predecessor and a few others had, had done this and primarily rural providers needed to do it because they were all far too small to form their own and their near neighbors weren't interested and so they needed to work across state lines and they needed to work nationally. So from the beginning, Caravan was organized as what we now call collaborative ACOs, where we have this non-owned, non-employment relationship among the members, and we needed an organization to provide the shared services, provide the training, provide the analytics to support success in the model. And Caravan grew out of that as the, the services organization and, and wanted to bring in the concept of making progress together uh, over time. And so uh, Caravan is a, a way of traveling, of course, is um, a, a collaborative effort and is a, an effort to share work and share resources. And uh, that's where the name Caravan came from. Caravan also, like you mentioned, has its roots in, in a rural uh, setting. And um, uh, by by Lynn Barr, I believe, who's who's also still serving uh, Caravan in um, uh, as a chairman um, and or chairwoman, and you, you know it's really interesting because I think maybe one of the I don't want to say criticisms, but one of the points of resistance, if you will, uh, that people have had about um, about the SEO model is that um, it's very difficult to make it uh, work um, in, in a rural setting. Uh, and yet Caravan uniquely is sort of built out of uh, the, the idea of being able to make it work uh, in a rural care setting. And I, I wanted to, to ask you a little bit about that. Um, as I understand it, part of the, the, the Caravan model, the formula that makes it work is that um, there has to be scale. And the way to do that is to get a lot of um, people to participate within the, within the ACO. Um, it, does the same sort of thing apply to um, an ACO in a, in a rural uh setting as as a, an urban setting a big city setting yeah absolutely and um you uh you said in that uh question a few times that what does it take to make it work and uh my one of my favorite econometrics professors in grad school said something like 90 percent of doing the work is doing the work and uh by which i think he means uh of rolling up your sleeves and digging in to to just figure things out and that's what we that's what the early caravan did that's what we still do uh we it's actually our 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 uh, logo now now the numbers work um we we've really built around a, a business model focus uh where we go in 
and help our clients figure out how to to make a sustainable business model out of this. Because you're right, it's not easy. Uh, certainly, one of the things that we've discovered over time is that that scale is uh, a necessary but not sufficient requirement for success. So you can't be successful in a risk-bearing contract as a 5,000 life ACO. The random variation is going to kill you. The confidence interval on an ACO that size is like 9%, uh, the 95% confidence interval. And you're trying to save two, three, four, five percent per year, right? So uh, if you save five percent, you're doing great work, but the random noise might take you to show you that you're losing four, by four percent, right? And you might even write a check someday. So uh, there's the the need to uh, to be in a large enough ACO, but then everyone in that ACO needs to be doing the the right investment and prevention and staffing their their teams pr appropriately. They need to be doing managing their high risk patients effectively. They need to be documenting and coding effectively. So uh, the the figuring out the tools to get the work done uh, in a very strained uh, work environment of uh, physician practices uh, where they they all almost everywhere you go uh, feel under-resourced and uh, are low on time because we've put a lot on the, the plate for physicians, especially primary care physicians. They, they have more demands on their time than they could possibly meet. And that's why we have to spend a lot of time with them uh, getting their staff straight, getting people to take work off of their plates so that they can uh, use their time most efficiently. Building on this idea of a, a collaborative effort that's, that's really necessary to make this um... Uh, make this work. You know, Caravan, I believe, has um, and maybe the stats are a little bit updated now, but you know, 20, 26,000 plus providers, six hundred thousand lives um, covered, and um, I imagine a lot of that is, you know, providers in competing uh, healthcare systems. Um, and let me know if that that's not accurate. Uh, but you know, how do you get people to work together? I mean, it's for it's for the common good for sure. Uh, but how do you get people to sort of work together? Uh, and, and not butt heads to go through this system. Yeah, we have mostly managed to avoid direct competitors working together, and there and there's a lot of reasons to prefer that. We um, uh, mainly around data sharing and the difficulties that you run into if uh, if you are in rooms frequently with competitors. But it, it comes up more the the more uh, clients we add certainly so uh, it, it is possible to work with competitors in our model and uh, and we have seen it done successfully um the the hard part is that, that there is just a lot of different actors in any uh, successful model here there there's a need to get uh, system buy-in there's a need to get clinic buy-in there's a number of technical factors that you have to work through with it staff and quality reporting staff and compliance and uh, all of that before you even get to re redesigning primary care workflows. So uh, th that's really where we've uh, developed our, our our best use cases and our best models. Um, and the you know the the proof of of concept of that. And uh, it was in 2018 that we started really bringing our client. We we had 38 ACOs at the time, um, and we started collapsing them to larger and larger ACOs because we had. We were saving 3% for the government on average, which should have generated about 1.5% in shared savings payments for our clients. But because of this small ACO problem, uh, many of them were not meeting their minimum thresholds. The, the minimum threshold goes down the larger you get and the, the reliability, the, the precision of the estimates goes up. So uh, we're now managing uh, with our partners about 12, uh, 12 ACOs in uh, 2020 last year. And uh, our, since we've created these large national collaboratives, we had a, a 240,000 life single ACO with 129 health systems in it in 2019. Um, and then similar arrangements in 2020, uh, our clients are gonna be receiving $120 million in shared savings payments uh, on the basis of those two years, 2019 and projected for 2020. 73% uh, in 2019, 86% in 2020. That's against national averages of about 50%. So uh, the the collaborative approach and and managing that scale, uh, while all of the all of the participants are doing the work and are accountable to each other and to us, uh, is producing the results that we uh, that we drew up on a whiteboard in 2018. I also read um, from a, a couple of the, the news releases. So 2019 was, um, as you mentioned, a re really important year. Um, I think part of the strategy to, to build out this huge collaborative ACO was to try to approach um, uh, state level uh, medical organizations, um, if I read that correctly. So 
that obviously would help with uh, getting people on board and, and agreeing and all pointing in the same direction. Um, I wonder if you can speak to that a, a little bit. How, how you know was there an, a strategy you guys kind of used to to approach um, the the medical organization? We've had a lot of good partnership with uh, state medical associations, state hospital associations, rural health associations, and health offices. Every state has a state office of rural health. Um, and for us, it's a, a combination of uh, knowledge sharing and, uh, and networking that, that's beneficial there. Uh, oftentimes, those are trusted advisors in a state. And so, uh, you know, we, we've developed a, a, a partnership with the Florida Hospital uh, Association, for instance, where we do webinars with them. We, we stay in touch with them and their membership and, uh, and trade notes on upcoming CMS initiatives, for instance. Um, we, we've also had some more formal partnerships and formal uh, relationships like with a, the Stratum Med IPA, which is a, an IPA out of, uh, out of Illinois that has, uh, that has provider partnership clients uh, all over the Pacific Northwest as well. Um, and you know, the, there's the, the, the benefits there can be, uh, there, it can streamline some, some contracting processes on both sides. Uh, but, but more importantly, we, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of good partners in the room who are able to, uh, to help us uh, pitch the vision to, to more providers who can benefit from this work. I'm really curious, you know, what kind of feedback do you get when you're, when you're pitching uh, uh, potential members? Do they, like, what really grabs your attention? Is it the, um, it's probably a lot of different things. I'm, leave, I'm going to leave that as an open-ended question. What really grabs your attention? Yeah, it's it's amazing the variety that you see out in the world, honestly, and how varied the the U.S. healthcare system is when you uh, when you talk to just the job descriptions of people who are put in charge of this work uh, at any given health system uh, or at any given physician's office. Uh, it could be the director, frequently we'll see someone who's the director or VP for managed care, or who's the, the chief medical officer could be in charge of this work. We could see someone who's from the contracting world, sometimes a quality improvement leader, uh, the chief nursing officer sometimes get involved. And then, you know, with physician groups and physician practices, there, there's far less administrative staff available. So you'll usually be talking to whoever the, the lead partner is or the whoever's leading population health for uh, a particular practice along with a, an individual administrative director. Um, and you, we get all sorts of varied responses. Uh, you know, we, we're not, there are some people who have zero interest in this and we don't talk to them because they don't want to talk to us. <laughs> um, but some of those people show up uh, a year or two later after they've seen results or after they've realize that there's some capability that they're missing. The part of the push for this, right, isn't that this, the, there's the business model push. And if the government and private payers have done a good job, then there should be a natural pull into this model if it's a good business model, right? And if we're doing a good job. And there's some of that, certainly. There's some direct pressure to join uh, risk-bearing models. And, uh, and that is driving a lot of the adoption and realization among providers that they need to uh, build certain capabilities that they don't have historically. Uh, just like think about this as a, a, a service line that they need to develop and to learn how to use the tools and technology effectively. So, um, uh, and then there's a whole bunch, uh, one dynamic you see is there's frequently, especially in systems with complicated decision-making structures, which is almost all uh, healthcare organizations of any size, um, you see the dynamic where there's there are champions and detractors, right? And frequently, but not always, uh, it's the chief financial officer who's uh, who's asking the tough questions, uh, and um, appropriately so. That uh, there, there's a lot of waste in healthcare, and there's a lot of uh, projects with good ideas that don't have solid uh, financial foundations, right? And so. Uh, the model needs to be tested and it needs to generate a return. And, and that's part of the reasoning behind how we've organized ourselves to be able to uh, help our clients see a return, not just hope for a return with shared savings two or three years from now, but begin to generate new population health revenues in the near term to generate new revenues from improvements in their 340B operations uh, and to take advantage of other payment opportunities that they might not be doing yet. You know, there's there's been enough publicity, I guess, enough writing around, um, you know, not everyone trying to start their own ACO has been successful at doing it. Um, so every every ACO is going to vary by, it's going to vary by region, it's going to vary by its uh, uh, demographic of the patient groups, uh, composition of uh, HCPs and, and so on. And so 
the there has to be um i guess an understanding that it's, it can work in some cases but it has to work in a certain way um and so maybe that has to be there's like an education piece uh, that has to go along with bringing people on board and i found that really um an interesting statistic something like a uh, hundred at least a hundred have have not really been all that successful in implementing the aco model depending on how you look at it that the, the... I wouldn't say that an ACO or a provider that goes into an ACO that doesn't generate shared saving the first year, it doesn't make them a failure per se. But if they're not organized around a, a clinical strategy where they're building their primary care capacity, because the whole model is organized around primary care, I, I should have, I should also note that. Um, if it's not a, a, a model that is uh, organized in a way that, that has shown at this point to have some chance of success, uh, you know, uh, really managing effectively very high cost patients, um, really going after a post acute care optimization strategy. Um, th there's a couple of other uh, common practices uh, that has a data infrastructure that is going to provide insight into how their patients are doing over time and where how their organization is trending. Um, especially early on, there were there were plenty of uh, failures of just lack of understanding of how hard the work was going to be, uh, and so. The, that's probably improved as the, the the industry has has adopted some standard best practices, but there's still a lot of variation in how systems approach this work and a lot of um, a lot of strengths and weaknesses that every system brings, right? Uh, that they need to address as they go in because there's a, in most organizations there's a fair amount of culture change required here and buy-in both at the administrative level and on the clinical level uh, is really important for success. And that's almost a point that I would want to reiterate that um, it, it does it does require a lot of work. Uh, you have to get buy-in from a lot of stakeholders um, because th there's quite a bit of a shift that would have to happen. Um, this is also a nice segue, I think, into um, some of the things that makes Caravan Health really unique uh, because you know we've been talking about um, the, the concept of an ACO um, and, and the fact that this is a very good economic model um, if, the, if you can get the numbers right. Uh, but what Caravan Health offers is actually, as I understand it, it's it's a suite of solutions. I mean, there's an entire ecosystem that goes around supporting um, members to actually join an ACO model. Uh, and uh, part of that is the technology, uh, telehealth uh, services. Um, there's also a big education component uh, that you help your members with. There's an analytics platform, um, and that's just scratching the surface. So I wanted to, uh, to dive into that a little bit. In terms of like the, the population health sort of approach, um, I think a, a big part of that has to do with it really enabling um, nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, other healthcare providers to really practice population health, um, which is part of their training anyways, much more so than they would in a typical sort of fee-for-service uh, type model where everything is really focused on, on acute care, getting patients out the door, volume, that sort of thing. Um, it's really interesting. And, and part of that, I, I believe uh, Caravan really also supports with training programs to actually help um, HCPs actually get on board with how to use this approach as opposed to going back to the traditional uh, acute care sort of uh, approach. And I wonder if you can uh, speak a little bit to that. Uh, the focus on, on getting nurses to do more of that prevention. You, you hit on a lot of important pieces of the model. So thanks for, for teeing that up. I, I barely need to add anything. So uh, just to, to illustrate how we, how we approach the work, um, we think it's really important for, uh, for practice and health systems to get organized around the business model, like I mentioned. Uh, and for us, that starts with a, an enhanced primary care model. So we'll go in and do an assessment of their primary care population health capabilities, uh, what sort of staff resources in particular they have, what their IT situation is, uh, and uh, go, go through that at, at check off and needs assessment. And um, generally, we're going to need them to identify uh, nurse care managers uh, or hire new nurses uh, for uh, any primary care practice that has uh, more than three physicians working there. Um, and then we're going to need to go through with them. Uh, we're going to need to train that nurse uh, on uh, population health skills, uh, behavioral interviewing, uh, man health coaching, managing patients who are not in your office, keeping track uh, of data in new ways, uh, coding opportunities, billing for preventive care. So we, we put a big emphasis uh, on uh, really effective annual wellness visits to, uh, to identify any gaps in care that patients are experiencing, to head off uh, likely uh, future incidents for, for higher risk patients and to, to close uh, documentation gaps at the same time, which are really important to identify in, in an ACO. 
Um, and that stuff, it requires a, a fair amount of training and materials and, uh, uh, and just handholding to, to get these programs up and running. And uh, as, uh, as our clients dem uh, demonstrate capabilities with that, with, with new ways of offering access to care for their patients, um, we then uh, help them with the next initiative, right? There, there, there's no standing still. There's, al there's always uh, ways to improve. And uh, the, the, the work starts with primary care, but then reaches to other parts of the health system as well. The tools we will bring will uh, it certainly will bring technology and we will work with their, uh, with their EMRs to pull out relevant clinical data to, to power those, uh, the, those insights and workflows I described. Um, we will provide to them tools that will help their nurse, uh, their nursing staff do their jobs and uh, streamline their time. Right, uh, the everyone uh, there are a number of uh, barriers to uh, effective care management that that we help our clients work through. Uh, we we offer patient messaging applications if they don't have something that they're happy with through their EMR. We help them keep track of the nurse's time so that they can bill for it uh, appropriately. Um, and then we've been adding uh, ancillary and, and additional services here as well. Um, most of our clients are 340B covered entities, which is this obscure uh, part of the uh, Public Health Service Act that allows safety net providers, rural providers, uh, federally qualified health centers to access discount, very large discounts on prescription drug pricing. Um, there are very big gaps in claiming rate uh, relative to eligibility to claim rate. Uh, like 80% of eligible claims don't go claimed. Uh, and so we're helping our, our clients figure that out as well. Um, and uh, we, we try to be a, a partner uh, and, uh, and take risk sharing with them as well. So we, we try to be a partner in all of the important moving pieces here. Uh, and and that, uh, that involvement for us is, uh, is really key to the, the success of the enterprise. I, I definitely wanted to come back to um, the 340B um initiatives that you work with your your members about uh, and how you know that might uh, evolve going forward um you, one of the other things that uh, that i saw uh, that caravan offers is this analytics um and reporting and, and monitoring platform um some of the data that that goes into that is actually collaborative uh, data or pool data from all the the members um so again really kudos for for being able to pull everything together and get everyone working together on that um i'm wondering is that platform was that built in house um and and is there a unique case study um, that you can think of that uh, that you, you might be able to share to sort of um, show how, how that kind of data could be leveraged. So you mentioned 340B. I imagine that it can help with identifying cost savings there. Uh, the, the annual wellness visits is another uh, important example that could come out of using the analytics platform. Uh, does anything else come to mind? Yeah. So the the data that you're describing comes from Medicare claims or for health uh, health payment claims. And it's a very robust and important data set for value-based operations. Um, and historically, and still to this day for non-ACO members, this, this data isn't available to uh, to providers, uh, which is which has been a long, long run problem for the Medicare program. Um, but with the, the founding of the Medicare Shared Savings Program, CMS did begin allowing ACO participants to access their claims data and a really robust infrastructure and ecosystem of companies that use that data to identify improvement opportunities uh, has sprung up from that, uh, from that data. Um, it, it's extremely rich and robust data and Caravan is, is, uh, is one of those companies that uses that data for, uh, for our work. Um, the, the data is, as I mentioned, is extremely rich. Uh, it, it is the record of uh, healthcare services and drug therapies received by patients that are served by the ACO looking back three years. And it's complete and comprehensive, uh, more or less. Uh, so, so it is the type of information that um, you might think would be in an EMR, but is not actually in an EMR. Because for a million reasons, um, it could be that the ACE, that the patient goes to a, uh, another health system for two thirds of their care. Uh, it could be that the client has two different EMRs that don't talk to each other, and so it lives in two different EMRs even within the, the hospital system or the, the provider group. Um, but the claims data set, if Medicare paid for it, it's in there, and so that that is uh, extremely valuable in being able to understand patient experience of care, uh, cost drivers, 
uh, imbalances in the performance of a group of providers in an ACO relative to others in an ACO. So we can create benchmarks of what does a median uh, practice look like? What does an efficient and uh, inefficient practice look like in terms of inpatient utilization or utilization around particular episodes of care, whether it's experiences of cancer and on uh, and oncology bundles or experiences around, um, you know, uh, classically like knee and hip operations uh, have benefited a lot from uh, standardization around um, post-surgical and post-acute care. So uh, the huge uh, opportunities have been uh, and insights have been generated from using this data and um, early ACOs, and I still actually see a number of, uh, of prospective clients doing this, uh, will take, would just take the claims and basically put it in an access database or an Excel database and sort of use some averages, look for like, look at the shiny, like, oh, this claim is enormous. What happened with this one patient who spent, who cost Medicare a million dollars last year? Was that like, what did that have to do with us? Um, there, there's a lot of uh, dead ends in that type of work. And so we've distilled, you know, over the years, we've uh, we've created hundreds, thousands of different reports for us and for our clients, and we've distilled those over time into to modules of uh, uh, how how a client is doing on key performance indicators in, uh, in care management and prevention, uh, how they're doing on care episodes that are likely to generate uh, downstream cost implications, uh, what are risk risk factors that uh, practices should be watching out for, for patients that are likely to have uh, problems later. So um, <clears throat> the combination of the data and then the financial structure we talked about earlier, where it's worth it to spend some time on this uh, and to, to invest upfront in certain, uh, certain avoidable events or certain care episodes uh, creates this, uh, this robust new world where uh, you can actually use that in a way that, that makes sense financially for the, the health system and for the patient. You mentioned uh, uh, Caravan's uh, team actually puts together a lot of these uh, reports that can help uh, its, uh, its members directly. Uh, hypothetically, let's say I'm a, I'm a member. Can I also uh, look at my own data or um, uh -huh. uh, look at benchmarks? Absolutely. Um, okay. uh, and the, we aren't the, the team we create the reports and we look at the reports, but we, we've we distilled these reports and share them and discuss them. They power our work with our clients. And so clients have access to all of our reports that we have access to. And if they want the raw claims data, uh, they can have it. Some some clients have their own in-house analytics teams that uh, that use the the data for other purposes or for, for supportive purposes. Uh, so yes, we do both. Really powerful, uh, you know, as somebody coming from a, a data science background, uh, working with a lot of claims data sets and, and um, uh, pharmacy data sets and that sort of thing, I can see the value in, in doing that. So awesome, awesome to hear. Um, yeah. Another uh, another interesting um, piece that uh, the Caravan, uh, service that Caravan offers is that uh, you've helped a lot of your members actually transition into a virtual care setting. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, the fact that uh, there's been uh, billing code uh, changes, um, let's call them, um, especially in uh, 2020, I believe. And uh, that's helped through that transition quite a bit. Uh, but you also offer technology platforms. Is that is that right? We do. We um, we don't offer a telehealth billing uh, service platform ourselves, but we've uh, helped our clients uh, choose vendors or, or figure out how to comply with the rules and how to bill for the services uh, on their own technology platforms. Um, we have during at the start of the pandemic, uh, we had a, a very swift need to help a lot of rural providers uh, get stood up on telehealth and virtual care quickly. And so um, we we turned on a dime and created a whole bunch of new resources, uh, spent a whole lot of time uh, on training webinars and uh, and workshops and um, and helped our clients through this. And, and our clients had a, a tr huge amount of creativity on their own, um, creating, you know, drive-through clinics and uh, some of our clients that were, you know, really invested in care management work before the pandemic turned it up, uh, multiplied it by, by five and were able to keep, to reach and touch all of their high-risk patients, keep them out of the emergency room during, the, during that process. And, and, and it was all through use of remote technologies and uh, and quick understanding of the new flexibilities that were allowed during the pandemic through, uh, partly through work with us. Really um, an important part of this uh, suite um, for anybody looking to transition into an ECO model um, because uh, not only was there a decrease in, in visits, um, just 
very broadly speaking. Uh, but at the same time, there's longer term implications because if patients are not going in for appointments that they need, uh, not getting the care that they need uh, as regularly as they would have had the pandemic not happened, uh, that has long-term implications for their own health outcomes as well. So helping um, organizations and, and um, uh, healthcare providers transition into uh, a system and a program that actually made sense for them uh, with, a, with a virtual care component um, that I'm sure would have helped tremendously. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about that as well. Um, so Tim, I know we're running uh, out of time. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, if going forward, if we look um, uh, into the next couple of years, um, what are some of the uh, things that Caravan is uh, planning for um, in terms of uh, expanding uh, or working more closely with its current members? Um, I know there's some work going on um, with uh, the, the CHART program. Uh, so CHART uh, stands for Community Health Access and Rural Transformation Model. Uh, that's some additional funding uh, to help rural uh, or smaller, smaller ACOs get up and running. Um, and then there's also some work I believe going on with the 340B uh, related savings and, and how you guys can further leverage uh, your, your expertise to help members uh, go through that. Yeah, so uh, you're exactly right on the CHART model. It is a, a new, version and an, uh, an updated version of the innovation center model from 2016 the aco investment model where uh, we and others brought a number of rural providers into the the aco program to the medicare shared savings program um, we we had about 50 percent of the acos in that model working with us uh, the program saved medicare 382 million dollars over the first three years and um, the the new chart model uh, is is a similar in construction and that CMS is going to offer loan funding, uh, forgivable loans to providers who join an ACO. And the terms of the forgivable loan are a little bit uh, unusual in that if you stay in the program for the entire five year time um, and you never generate shared savings, then the loan's forgiven. Uh, of course, that's not a great outcome for anyone, but the, uh, the, uh, the access to the loans can, can defray the upfront costs and cash needs of joining these programs. If you generate shared savings in the program, then you repay the loan to CMS. And so um, we are expecting to uh, to be recruiting. Uh, we're actually doing a webinar on this. Um, uh, I want to say the the fourth next week, and um, we're going to be going into great detail. If anyone wants to join, CaravanHealth.com. Um, and uh, we are going to be uh, accepting letters of intent to join the program with us by until the end of March. Uh, but it, it's a great opportunity for rural providers to get some help from CMS in, in joining at uh, very low or, uh, or no cost for the first few years. Uh, and you're also right, uh, we were really excited about uh, new work that we're doing with our provider clients in the 340B program. Um, this is a program for safety net providers, uh, for dish hospitals, for federally qualified health clinics and rural providers. Um, and the, the program in general uh, it has, uh, most providers are not accessing most of what they're entitled to under the law. And uh, we are able to help them um, both uh, document and manage the patients that are, uh, that are uh, using these prescriptions and help them implement programs where uh, they are uh, continuing many of the, the most expensive uh, patients involved here are also uh, not being uh, managed well in their uh, handoff to specialists. And so uh, the combination of the ACO workflows of uh, putting in place better um, better management of coordination uh, between different specialists in the healthcare system, transitions of care, uh, along with the insights around where they're missing those uh, the opportunities to claim those uh, is a really big opportunity for, for most 340B covered entities. And uh, so we're very excited to help our clients with that now too. Awesome. I'm definitely looking forward to, uh, to hearing more about that. Um, and also um, other interesting things uh, happening with, um, with Caravan Health and supporting its current members. So um, Tim, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Um, really had an interesting time hearing a lot more about the ACO model and, and hopefully we um, uh, can get the word out on how a lot of uh, healthcare providers uh, can actually benefit from this model um, and also how a lot of patients can benefit from it because ultimately this is a program that's aimed to help population health um, as well as um, uh, generate shared savings. So really interesting to hear about this. Um, I loved our conversation and uh, you know we look forward to, to hearing a lot more about uh, Caravan and, uh, and ACO going forward. It's great talking to you, Doran. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks so much. All the best. Thank you.